Good morning. I'm Carol Miller, board member at Opportunity House. Many years ago, in the early 80s, a group called Southwest Christian Ministries got together and formed a group to do something about homelessness in Reading. That was the first start. A couple of years later, Trinity and Christ Episcopal decided that they wanted in on this too. Since they were north of Penn, had to change the name. And then it became Reading Urban Ministries. Uh, we, the homeless people went from church to church. And since Trinity has no basement, the people stayed at Christ Episcopal and Trinity provided money for showers and toilets to be built at Christ Episcopal. And this went on for many years until in 1988, we got the property at Second and Buttonwood, and that is where Opportunity House is today. Until then, it was called Reading Emergency Shelter. This year, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary. I got started in 1989 when Francis Jones was at this very same lectern saying we have to do something for the homeless in Reading. They're starving, they're on the streets. We're going to feed them here at Trinity. And we did for two years. And I came in and helped, with, helped Francis with that ministry and I've just never stopped. I'm still there. But on December 2nd this year, we're going to be having a big gala at the Crown Plaza to celebrate our 30 years. It's going to be a big fundraiser and lots of fun too. So I hope that you will keep that in mind. I'm sure many of you have gotten a save the date card in the mail and I hope you will be able to attend. Now we have a new way of raising money at Opportunity House to keep the homeless off the street. And our newest employee, Kristen Irwin, is here to tell you all about her new and exciting job and what she's doing to help us. Good morning. Uh, very excited to tell you about our retail and reuse program. Um, Opportunity House is one of just a few nonprofits in the United States that was selected by the St. Vincent de Paul Society in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, we're currently receiving training and funding to start what they call a waste-based business. But I think the name's a little funny because absolutely nothing goes to waste. Let me explain. Um, first and foremost, our clients and our residents are our first priority. Anything that they need, such as furniture, clothing, etc., they get. First priority always is our residents. So you can be sure that your donations go to a good use. Um, higher priced items that we can sell online, we've been selling on eBay and also Half.com for books. Um, we can earn a lot of money for the Missions of Opportunity House that way. We're also saving items in our Reading Warehouse for our retail store, which will be opening in March of next year. Uh, think of a mall store, but with thrift store prices. It's going to have an excellent book section as well, well organized and well stocked, larger than what you're used to in your normal thrift store. Um, also, we will be having a, well, we've started rummage sales that occur every second Saturday of the month. This has been a great way to get low cost items to local neighborhood residents. Items that can't be resold or given away have been recycled, and Opportunity House is proud to have recycled over 31,000 pounds of items since the beginning of this program, items that would have normally gone into a landfill. Uh, in just a few months, we've seen improvements, um, increases in sales, extra money for the programs, the missions of Opportunity House, and we hope that you can help us with this. It's time to clear out that closet clear out that basement, go through your attic, figure out those clothes that don't fit anymore, donate a bag of books, whatever you might have at home. We'll be very happy to receive it today and the next two Sundays. And we also offer pickup service at your home for donations over 100 pounds, which sounds like a lot, but really isn't. 
So give us a call. You can contact me um, through Opportunity House or here at the church. I'll be happy to help you if you have any questions. And uh, thank you so much. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Glorious God, your generosity waters the world with goodness, and you cover creation with abundance. Awaken in us a hunger for the food that satisfies both body and spirit. And with this food, fill all the starving world through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Now, when Jesus heard about the beheading of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. 
And Jesus said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down in the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the crowds and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. They kept on coming, one after another, singly and in family groups. And before too long, July's Courtyard Cafe was a rousing success. Probably among the largest, what I heard from those who knew better than I. One after another, hungry people, hungry for food and for conversation and companionship. One after another, they came and were fed. Though at times I think everyone wondered, was there gonna be enough today? I think there was a little bit of scurrying around for some baked beans toward the end, but there was enough of everything that everyone got fed something. There was enough and more than enough. Please take a copy of this month's issue of The Lutheran because on the very last page, the presiding bishop's commentary is quite a commentary on scarcity and abundance. The particular scripture reference that she uses was not a familiar one to me, but it was a variation on a theme in the Hebrew scriptures. The theme of a prophet asking something who, of a person who appears to have little or nothing to share. The one that has always resonated with me is the time Elijah asks a meal from a woman who with her son is virtually on death's door for lack of food. In 1 Kings 17, Elijah asks her for food and she says, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. They were at the end of their rope and their existence. Then Elijah says to her those famous introductory words of scripture, do not be afraid. Okay, folks, listen up. Every time we hear those words, do not be afraid in scripture, we know God is about to do something special. Announce something special. Do not be afraid. When everything inside of you says, Ugh, Elijah says, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterwards make something for you and your son. Rather cheeky of that prophet Elijah, the widow is ready to crawl up and die due to the drought, and now the stranger says, give me some of the little you have left, and expects her to give it to him first. Yikes. Yet he prefaces that whole encounter with the words, do not be afraid. The less familiar scripture that our presiding bishop shares in this issue of the Lutheran is about Elijah's successor, Elisha. I have to speak very slowly to keep those prophets separated. Elisha and another widow sharing the sad tale that her husband is dead 
And now a creditor is coming to take her two children as slaves because she cannot pay the debts. Elisha asks her what she has in the house, and she replies, I have nothing except a jar of oil. Elisha tells her to go and borrow oil vessels from the neighbors, and not just a few, it is recorded. All the vessels in the village. She's to go into the house and start to fill all the vessels with oil. Well, the vessels are gathered. She fills them until there are no more vessels in the whole of the town, and then the flow of oil stops. Elisha tells her to take the oil and use it to pay off the creditors. God has given her an abundance so that she may save her children. In a pastor's Bible study last week, as we read the lessons out loud to begin our study together, I commented that our first reading is among one of my favorite pieces of scripture. And one of the other pastors asked, why? And I realized that oftentimes when I've asked about a favorite piece of scripture, no one seems to ask why. And I had to think about it. How could I express to someone else what that particular piece of Isaiah meant for me? I finally was able to put together the the whole idea about the abundance, the free gifts of God, the free grace, as we read those words, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Abounding abundance without money and without price. Oil vessels filled to the brim and overflowing enough to pay the woman's debts. God's free grace for all. The wide open grace and love of God for those exiles of Isaiah's time and for us, reminding us that as Psalm 145, which is the one appointed for today if during the Pentecost season we were using the Psalms, but very familiar words of refrain that is throughout the Hebrew scriptures. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. One time when I had a Bible on my computer, I did a word search on this phrase. Where else in scripture was it and how many times? I don't remember, but it's a lot. The Lord is gracious, merciful, full of compassion, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. One of the great refrains of Hebrew scripture. And I think one of the purposes of that phrase is so that the people of God might come to know what is God's character, God's personality in relationship to God's people. Gracious, merciful, full of compassion, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. An invitation to the abundant life is how one commentator describes the passage from Isaiah. In the midst of the desolation of the exile from the ancient Israelites in Babylon, taken from Jerusalem, there are gifts of God, even in the midst of their desolation, gifts of God for the people of God. Come to me that you may live. The invitation that the prophet shares begins with references to the material, water, wine, milk, bread. 
the provision for our bodily needs. And the Lord asked the question, why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Our existence is way more than food. Our existence are the gifts of God for the people of God. Promised outrageous abundance opens the way for hearing the promise of a renewed covenant, an everlasting covenant. A reminder that what it is all about is relationship to God above all else. And that outrageous abundance is evident in our gospel lesson. Turns out that a story of feeding however many thousand, the number varies, appears in all four gospels and with two additional encounters. Six times in the four Gospels, we have a feeding of a crowd. Here in Matthew, Jesus feeds about 5,000 men, oh, and some women and children too. And in Matthew 15, Jesus feeds 4,000 men, again, along with uncounted women and children, that time with seven loaves and a few small fish. In each account, there's an amazing amount left over. What? How? One Sunday, doing what I to myself called my show and tell worship on the Lutheran Homes Skill Dementia Unit, I gathered five small, small dinner rolls from the culinary department, put them in a small basket, along with two paper fish, only so much reality. I retold the story as our gospel lesson and my meditation, and then used those five loaves as my bread for communion. I went around the circle of about 30 residents and family members sharing bread and wine, pieces of bread pulled off the rolls and dipped into the wine. There were a lot of people in the room that day and I kept pulling off pieces of bread in various sizes that happen when you have real bread. The pieces of bread were not carefully portioned out as when I used the wafers. My helper, holding the chalice, and I, at the end, came around to the beginning of the circle, and I put the basket and the chalice on my portable altar, and she and I looked at the basket in awe. We both had to stop. I had begun the administration with five, about this big, dinner rolls for the whole group. And I actually thought, is it all going to make it? Do I have enough? And I had some wafers under the cart just in case. I started with five dinner rolls. Now everyone had been fed, residents, some family members, some staff, my assistant and I, and we looked at the basket. There were four and a half rolls left in the basket. Everyone had plenty, various sizes of bread, and I had only used half to three quarters of the roll, God provided more than I could have imagined. I have to mention that day also that our Helen, who turned 104 on Thursday, did receive part of that abundance. But that experience once again was a reminder to me of trusting God to give the abundance. We return again and again to the Eucharist, to hear God's word and to partake of the bread and the wine as a foretaste of the new creation. 
Such is God's feast of outrageous abundance that all of our feeble efforts to hoard God's love are thrown away as we hear the words, the body of Christ given for you. From the, from the words of Isaiah, listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in the rich food, incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Jesus, in the midst of his grief, overhearing the news of John the Baptist's execution, has compassion for, feels in his gut the needs of the people. The disciples come to him and suggest, oh, just, just send them back home. They can get things back home. And Jesus says, you take care of it. You give them something to eat. And they see the little that they have. What good is that with this crowd? That God supplied the abundance. The leftovers were 12 baskets full. Enough and more than enough for our journey in this life. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Listen carefully to me, says the Lord. Eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. The gifts of God for the people of God will soon be offered. There is enough and more than enough for us all. Amen.
by the Spirit, let us join the whole people of God in Christ Jesus in praying for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Incline your ear and come to us, gracious and merciful God. Raise up among our congregations strong leaders to guide mission work so that everyone who hungers is fed. We pray for our covenant congregation, Christ Episcopal Church, and for Father John, for Trinity Deaf, Deaf and Pastor Rick, and for the West Berks Mission District Music Camp and its leaders and campers. Lord, in your mercy. The earth flourishes in your steadfast love and care. Open your hand to satisfy the desire of every living thing and have compassion over all that you have made. Help us daily to be mindful of how we use your resources. Lord, in your mercy. In this war-torn world, the thirst for justice and peace is never quenched. We pray for those who live under tyranny and war, especially in the Middle East and the Ukraine. Watch over them and be near to all who call upon your name. Lord, in your mercy. When we are falling, hold us up. When we are bowed down with grief or loneliness, raise us up. When we are hungry, fill us. When we are sick, heal us. We pray especially for Carl, Beth, Annie, Dorothy, Annabelle, Frank, Ralph, Andrea, David, Rodney and Dorothy, Tom, Pat, Joan, Brian, Bill, and Jan Rita. Lord, in your mercy. Accompany all those experiencing life transitions, those pursuing new studies, those who are retiring, and those moving to new communities. Give them the courage to embrace change and flourish in their new roles. Be with our vestry and staff as we enter a time of pastoral transition. We also pray for members of our Trinity family, Thomas and Louise Souders, Nancy Souders Negri and Fred Negri, Allison, Jason, and Marley Spangler, Tom and Mamie Spatz, and Joe, Lisa, Joey, Robbie, and Katie Spies. Lord, in your mercy. With gratitude for their loving witness and faith-filled lives, we remember those who have died. Receive the praise of all those who call upon your name. Lord, in your mercy.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. <laughs>